chorus after verse 2 and 4 only. Give me the Bible. What a great song that is. We all should have a, a great desire for the Word of God. We're going to begin our study in Mark chapter 13 and verse 31. If you have your copy of the Bible, if you don't have a Bible here and you're visiting, we have almost, I think, 400 Bibles in the library. We want to give you one of those Bibles. We want you to have your own copy of the Word of God. I think about the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 4 before his death. He told Timothy to bring him his books and the parchments. And I can't help but think that some of those would have included the Word of God, his copies of the Holy Scriptures. Give me the Bible. We're going to be talking about the Bible this morning. Our study this morning, our sermon topic is called, Can We Trust the Bible? Here's the short answer, yes. All right. Now the rest of the sermon will give you the long details about why we can trust the Bible. Last week we talked about how we got the Bible. This is a separate and different study. Today we're talking about can we trust the Bible. And I want to give you some reasons why what you have in your hand is trustworthy and why we need to continue to share the Word of God with as many people as possible and to guard our faith as well. We can trust what we have in the Word of God. What better place than to begin with Jesus? Consider Jesus and His words in Mark chapter 13 and verse number 31. I want you to notice what Jesus says here in Mark 13 verse 31. Jesus said, Heaven and earth will pass away, but My words will not pass away. Notice that Jesus makes it clear His words will remain forever. That's because His words are from above. They are divine in every way. And they will remain. The heavens and the earth will pass away, but the Word of the Lord will endure forever. We can trust what God, what Jesus has told us in the Word of God because they are from above. I'm turning over to Matthew chapter 26 and I want you to notice in verse number, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 28, I want you to notice what Jesus or the angel said concerning Jesus after His resurrection. In Matthew chapter 28, when Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to the tomb, in verse number 6, the angel said to the women, He is not here. For He has risen, just as He said. Come, see the place where He was lying. I love that language, just as He said. You see, when Jesus says something, we should believe it. And He tells us that His Word will not pass away. In fact, this is what the New Testament writers and the Old Testament writers spoke concerning their words. That these are words that are inspired by God. One of the best examples of inspiration and one of the best examples of the preservation of the Word of God is found in Jeremiah chapter 36. I want you to turn over there real quickly. In Jeremiah chapter 36, we find a great example of how God's Word will never pass away. In the days of Jeremiah, we see a king who would be against God and what His Word had to say. In Jeremiah chapter 36 and verse number 1, In the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. We're not going to read this whole chapter, but I would encourage you to read it on your own. I want you to notice, though, this idea of inspiration and God giving His word to Jeremiah. Number one, the word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Look at verse 2. Take a scroll and write on it all the words which I have spoken to you, Israel and concerning Judah. Jeremiah is going to receive God's Word. He's going to write it down on a scroll. We talked about this last week, which I have spoken to you concerning Israel and concerning Judah and concerning all the nations from the day I first spoke to you from the days of Josiah even to this day. Perhaps the house of Judah will hear all the calamity which I plan to bring on them in order that every man will turn from his evil way. Then I will forgive their iniquity and their sin." You see, he wanted Jeremiah to write these words down so that they could be read, so that the people of God could be warned, so that they would repent and turn away from their sins. Now watch how this is going to be written in verse number 4. Then Jeremiah called Baruch the son of Neriah, and Baruch wrote on a scroll at the dictation of Jeremiah all the words of the Lord which he had spoken to him. 
Jeremiah is the one who's inspired. And Jeremiah is going to speak the Word of God. And Baruch is going to write the Word of God or write what Jeremiah has given to him. And so now this scroll is going to be sent out. And individuals are going to read these very words. In verse number 13, we see individuals who had declared to uh, the people of God all the words that they had heard when Baruch read from the book to the people. For some, there was great fear. Ladies and gentlemen, we should have great fear when we consider the Word of God. We need to listen to the warnings of God. In verse 16, when they had heard all the words, they turned in fear one to another and said to Baruch, we shall surely report all these words to the king. There's impending judgment that's going to take place. And they asked Baruch saying, tell us please, how did you write all these words? Was it at his dictation? Then Baruch said to them, he dictated all these words, talking about Jeremiah, to me. And I wrote them with ink on the book. So he doesn't take credit for these words. Rather, he says, no, Jeremiah, the one who's inspired, he is the one that spoke these words, and I'm the one that wrote these words. And so eventually it gets before the king at this time. In verse 22, the king now is going to hear these words. And in verse number 23, after three or four columns had been read, the king cut it with a scribe's knife and threw it into the fire until the scroll was consumed in the fire. So the king hears the word of God, and what does he do with it? He destroys the scroll of the book. He is seeking to destroy the word of God. Ladies and gentlemen, no king no government, no individual, no leader will ever be able to destroy God's Word. In verse 27, the Word of the Lord came to Jeremiah after the king had burned the scroll and the words which Baruch had written at the dictation of Jeremiah saying, take again another scroll and write it on all the former words that were on the first scroll which Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, burned. In verse 32, Jeremiah took another scroll and gave it to Baruch, the scribe, and he wrote on it at the dictation of Jeremiah all the words of the book which Jehoiakim, king of Judah, had burned in the fire, and many similar words were added to them. What's the point of this? One, I love the story. Two, it's showing us the preservation of God's word. Men will seek to destroy the word of God, but God's word has been preserved for thousands of years. And it will always be preserved. That's a promise because Jesus said heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will remain. As we think about trusting the Bible, we can trust the Bible because Jesus said, no, my words, they are from above. They are not from this world. They will remain as will the rest of the scripture. We can trust what we have in the word of God because of a huge archaeological discovery back in the mid-1900s. I'm talking about the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls were found. There were 931 documents found uh, near and in the Qumran Caves uh, in Israel. And it's been said that the Dead Sea Scrolls are considered the greatest manuscript discovery of modern times. Here's a photo here of the Qumran Caves in Israel near the Dead Sea. This is one of the great reasons Not that we need this to trust the Word of God, but it simply reaffirms that what we've had for the thousands of years before this uh, huge documental find was ever discovered has been God's Word, and we can trust it. These 931 documents contain fragments and manuscripts of all the books in the Old Testament except for the book of Esther. And there was more than just biblical books that were found. There were a number of other books that were found. Jewish literature, it gives us more insight about that time. Um, Other kinds of texts. But 200 plus manuscripts that were found. This has huge ramifications upon the trustworthiness of the Word of God. You see, these ancient copies of manuscripts help us to reaffirm that where we have in our Old Testament and where our Old Testament has come from has been accurate in every way. Before their discovery, the oldest known complete Hebrew manuscript of the Old Testament was called the Ben Asher Codex, or was called or referred to as a Masoretic text by Jewish scribes. And that text, the Codex, the Ben Asher Codex, dates to about 108 A.D., Why is that important? Well, if it dates to about 108 A.D. or 1008 A.D., excuse me, 1008 A.D., 
It's about a thousand years later after the last books of the Old Testament had been penned, going back to around 325 B.C. Well, why is this important? Well, the Ben Asher Codex served for translations of the Old Testament and for other books. Think about our King James Bible. Some of you may be using the King James translation. Well, that was from the Ben Asher Codex, which was about a thousand years after those Old Testament books were written. There were other books like Kittles, Biblia, Hebraica, and other uh, books as a result of the Ben Asher Codex. This codex is found in Russia, the Leningrad Library, but this is why this is so critical. When the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, well, they're about a thousand years earlier than the Ben Asher Codex. And what we can determine finding the Dead Sea Scrolls, these 931 documents or the 200 plus of the biblical documents, is that we could look at these documents that were way closer to the original writings and see where the copies and translations that we had, which has given us books like the King James Bible, were those true and accurate? And the answer to that is yes. One of the more ex, uh, powerful uh, manuscripts that is found or was found is called the Isaiah Scroll. And the Isaiah Scroll, think about how important the book of Isaiah is. The Isaiah Scroll was found around 125 B.C. Mao's in the Lord's Supper talk read from Isaiah 61. That's where Jesus was reading from. The Ethiopian eunuch is reading from Isaiah chapter 53 in his copy of the Old Testament text. Well, the Isaiah scroll from the Dead Sea Scrolls shows us that a thousand years closer to the original, that what we've had has been accurate in every way. 95% exactly the same. And the 5% variation only differed in name spellings and does not affect any Bible doctrine at all you see the dead sea scrolls is reason to believe that what we have in our bible is trustworthy reason to believe that even though we had older copies further away from the originals were carefully preserved by god and men like the scribes who took great deal and care in recording these events but it's not just the dead sea scrolls remember we have ultimately the words of jesus we have the words of Jesus. His words will never pass away. We have the Dead Sea Scrolls. And there's plenty more of historical accuracy of the Scriptures that help us to see that what you have in your hand, it is trustworthy with respect to events, with respect to locations, and with respect to people. All right, You can trust what you have. This is not a book of fairy tale or fiction or anything like that. This is reality. And let me give you a couple of examples of what I mean by this. This is at the Israel Museum that I went to in 2018. It's called the, the Archaeologist the uh, King. And it's an inscription from King Nebuchadnezzar who took the Israelites into captivity in Jerusalem in 586 B.C. This cuneiform writing here on this cylinder, what it actually talks about is a more ancient find that King Nebuchadnezzar found during his time, he was finding and doing some excavations of a temple's foundation and found ancient inscriptions of a king from some 1700 years before him. Now think about that for a second. King Nebuchadnezzar, we know, was a real king. We know that the Babylonians took the Israelites into captivity. And we have this king doing his own archaeological discovery and finding ancient kings that came centuries before him. It is fascinating. It's a reminder that the individuals that are mentioned in God's Word are true and real. It's another reason for you to trust the Word of God. This is going back to 2012, if I'm right. There's Nikki right there. We're in Houston. We're looking at the Cyrus Cylinder. Here's another cylinder. And if you know about the Babylonians, then you also know about the Persians and King Cyrus. The Cyrus Cylinder is reason for you to believe that what we have in the Word of God is indeed true. Look how detailed that is in this cuneiform writing. This is how many historical events would be recorded and preserved throughout the years. Why is the Cyrus Cylinder so important for us? It's another piece of evidence that we have that the names 
places and events in the Bible, they are true. Cyrus was a uh, son of Camses, the king of Persia. Uh, he would defeat the Midian king in 550 BC. And then in 539, he conquered Babylon. We talk about this in our Bible classes, don't we? We talk about the Assyrians, we talk about the Babylonians, and we talk about the Medo-Persian Empire as well. That was the vision that Nebuchadnezzar had in Daniel chapter 2. And what we have here from Cyrus, and this is where it's located in the British Museum, and it was found in 1879. So some of these um, pieces of evidence continue to be found. The Dead Sea Scrolls were in the mid-1940s, and things like the Cyrus Cylinder in the late 1800s. Why is it so important? Well, on it was inscribed the orders of Cyrus after capturing Babylon in 539 B.C. to release the captives. And this would entail the Israelites and many others who had been enslaved during that time under the reign of Babylon. But I want you to point back to the Bible. I want to point you back rather to the Bible because this is why this is such a big deal. I want you to turn over in your Bible, and I want you to mark this in Isaiah chapter 44. Ladies and gentlemen, what we have in the Word of God is different and unique than any other book ever written by anyone else. What we have is predictive prophecy. And Cyrus, more than 100 years before his birth, was spoken of by Isaiah. This was not written after the life of Cyrus. This was foretold about Cyrus. And what Isaiah does, he mentions him by name. It is I who says of Cyrus in Isaiah 44 and verse number 28, He is my shepherd, and he will perform all my desire. And he declares of Jerusalem, she shall be built. And of the temple, your foundation will be laid. It's Cyrus who's going to release the captives to allow them to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. If you turn over to 2 Chronicles chapter 36, remember that this was foretold about the Israelites being taken, the southern kingdom being taken into captivity for a span of 70 years. Now look over in 2 Chronicles chapter 36 and verse number 22. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, Jeremiah spoke about this king. He spoke about the captivity. He spoke about the return. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he sent a proclamation throughout his kingdom and also put it in writing saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. And he has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever there is among you of all his people, may the Lord his God be with him and let him go up. Well, the Cyrus Cylinder speaks about Cyrus releasing the captives. And it's a, it's a really powerful declaration of what he would accomplish. And so another piece of archaeological evidence that points to King Cyrus who was foretold by Isaiah more than 100 years before his birth. You see, whether it's the Dead Sea Scrolls or the uh, King Nebuchadnezzar's um, cylinder or the Cyrus, Cyrus Cylinder, we have plenty of evidence that points back to the trustworthy nature of God's Word, of people, of locations, and also of events that would happen. I took this photo in Israel as well. These are the stones that were toppled down, destroyed at the temple when the temple was destroyed in 70 A.D. I want you to think about the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 24. Here again is another reason to trust that what you have in your Bible, it is indeed true. In Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 and 2, we've already seen the trustworthy nature of God's Word. They will never pass away. And they are always true. In Matthew 24, verse 1 and 2, Jesus came out from the temple and was going away when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him. And he said to them, do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone will be left upon another which will not be torn down. Well, the words of Jesus came to pass in 70 A.D. Decades after he spoke about the destruction of the temple, his words came to pass. A prophecy, another prophecy that was true in every way. Whether it's the Cyrus Cylinder, Nebuchadnezzar Cylinder, um, the destruction of the temple, 
there's so much archaeological evidence that points to the trustworthiness of the Word of God. This is referred to as the pilot, pilot stone. It's located at Israel Museum. I saw this as well. And it was found in Caesarea Maritima in Israel in 1961. I find that interesting too. We read about a man by the name of Pilate in the Bible in Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3 is a, is a text that I like to take people to when I'm studying with them to show them the trustworthiness of the New Testament documents. Because what Luke is going to do here, remember Luke was a historian, and what Luke does here, he gives names for us to go and fact check. If you don't believe me, you go check these people out for yourself. He talks about the rulers at that time. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip was tetrarch of the region of Itatura and Trachonitis, and Licinius was tetrarch of Abilene. Luke speaks about this man by the name of Pilate. And the New Testament speaks about this man by the name of Pilate. And there has not been much evidence outside of the New Testament documents about this man by the name of Pilate. But what it does show us is that Pilate was a real person, and we know that he was living in the days of Jesus. And this stone gives us another piece of evidence that what God says in His Word, it is indeed true. Pontius Pilate was a Roman prefect who presided over the trial of Jesus of Nazareth in Matthew 27. The content of the, of the inscription and the use of the Latin language hint at the level of Romanization throughout the province and in Caesarea at the beginning of the first century A.D. Well, the Pilate stone, Pilate stone is another piece of evidence pointing back to the trustworthy nature of the Word of God. Whether it's the Dead Sea Scrolls, the historical accuracy of the Scriptures, the words of Jesus, we have every reason to trust that what we have is indeed true. Now, what about the translations that we have? Now, we do not have the original writings of the New Testament. We don't have what's called the autographs, but what we do have are what's called copies. We have copies. We have manuscripts that help us to know that for certain that what we have is accurate, that will help us to know that what we have is what God always intended us to have. There have been charts throughout the years that I have used um, that have shown descriptions between the New Testament documents and other historical or ancient books. I believe this is a really powerful example to share with others that when you think about the New Testament, the New Testament was written close, or the copies that we have uh, were very close to when the New Testament would have been written. Uh, all the books would have been completed before the end of the first century. We know that Jesus lived in the first century, as did the apostles. And some of the earlier manuscripts that we have are really close to the time of the original documents, which means that there's no time for myths and things like that and legends to creep in. And if you just compare it to other ancient books where there's really no argument about whether or not what we have is trustworthy, and consider the vast amount of manuscripts and fragments of the New Testament, um, this is really a powerful piece of evidence that what we have, again, is true to the highest degree. Now, people sometimes have questions about manuscripts, or I'm sorry, about translations, so let's talk a little bit more about translations. Why do we need to know about translations? Well, simple. We need to know about translations because what we hold in our hand, it is a translation. To know and understand God's Word translations are needed because there are people of all different tongues all around the world that need to be able to read God's Word. The Word of God was written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. And so we need to have translations and we need to know about this. What is a translation? Sometimes we refer to it as a version. We say, well, I use the King James Version or the New American Standard translation. It's a rendering of something from one language to another language. In 2016, when I was in Harlem, New York, preaching, a brother in Christ, Gardner Hall, was standing next to me. It's a bilingual congregation. I preached in English, and he translated it to Spanish. Right, Ryan, when you were out in India, you spoke in English, and you had a translator translating your words. Well, that's exactly what we have here. It's a translation from one language to the next. Some people may ask, well, I don't know. Should we really have 
translations? Well, the answer to that again is yes. Unless you want to learn Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic and be an expert in it, okay? But we need to have these translations so again, we can know the Word of God. I want you to think about the day of Pentecost. It may not be the exact um, parallel, but I want you to think about the day of Pentecost. In Acts chapter 2, remember when the church began in Acts chapter 2, there are thousands of Israelites and Jewish individuals who are gathering in Jerusalem. The twelve apostles receive power from on high, power from the Holy Spirit, and they begin in verse 4 to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. The fact that there were so many people from so many different places required that they would speak in tongues so that they could understand and hear the gospel message. In verse number 9, 10, 11, you have all these different places from where these people were, and they're all hearing the apostles speak in their own tongues. Tongues is referring to a language. And they heard them speaking of the mighty deeds of God. That would be required as the church began. And certainly the tongues and miracles would help confirm the Word of God as well. But they spoke in a variety of languages because there were people from different nations and different tongues in the audience. And they needed to understand the gospel message as well. So do we, which is why we need translations as well. A question that people may ask, another question is, well, how long have translations been around? Well, translations have been around for a very long time. One of the most important translations is what's called the Greek Septuagint. And the Greek Septuagint is a translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. This translation was used in the days of Jesus and also by the apostles. If you read sometimes in your New Testament and you see a quote from the Old Testament and you go back to the Old Testament and you read it and you say, well, it doesn't read exactly like it says in the Old Testament. It's because they were probably quoting from the Greek Septuagint. It's a fascinating study. The New Testament was written in Greek. But before it came, the Old Testament was translated into Greek. I like what one person said here. It was in God's providence that the Septuagint, by its language and vocabulary, would open up the way for the gospel in a world dominated by Greek. It's known in manuscripts as according to the 70. And we generally refer to it by the Latin name Septuagint. It is one of the uh, best examples of the importance of a translation. It was made in the 3rd to 2nd century B.C. in Alexandria, Egypt. And we have evidence of even Jesus quoting from the Greek Septuagint as he quoted from Scripture in Matthew chapter 22 and verse number 32. I believe this is an example here of Jesus quoting from the Greek Septuagint as he goes back and talks about Exodus chapter 3 and verse number 6. A translation like Hebrew to Greek, while sometimes things can be lost in translation, but the Hebrew to Greek did not alter the fact that the message always remained the Word of God. And so translations are ones that can be reliable. Certainly you have to do research and make sure that they are handling the text so word for word or to the best of the ability. But translations have been used from, for a long time. Let me read you another quote. Scholars generally agree that the Septuagint is not as reliable a translation as the Hebrew text of the Old Testament. So if you have the original text, obviously it's going to be a lot more accurate in nature. Yet despite this reality, the New Testament frequently quotes it. However, as one author observed, the writers of the New Testament appear to have been so careful to give the true sense of the Old Testament that they forsook the Septuagint versions whenever it did not give that sense. And I think that's a really powerful thing for us to consider. They're inspired by God. And so God is going to give us His Word for sure. You see, Bible translations have been around for a long time. What we have today with translations is not something that is new. All right, Translations have been, along, have been around for a long time. Maybe even with the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8, he's reading from Acts chapter, um, or reading from Isaiah 53. Uh, maybe he knew uh, Hebrew, 
But maybe that was also a translation as well. So has the Bible come through several translations? There's a game sometimes that people will try to describe you know, how we got the Scriptures. Some bring up the idea of the telephone game when it comes to Bible translations. And just, you know, over a period of time, we just really have lost what the original documents said. This is the idea that translations simply borrowed from other translations and we've lost the original message of Jesus. Well, that simply is not the case. Let me read a quote here. Our modern Greek text may be described as a reconstructed or restored text. Only two alternatives are available if we seek to print a Greek text. Either we can select one manuscript and make it the standard text, or we can consult a number of manuscripts and authorities, and by comparison, construct a text which we feel is like the original. If we choose the former course, we are destined to failure, for no one manuscript is free from obvious scribal errors. If we choose the latter course, we will be assured of getting much closer to the original New Testament autographs. For this reason, the latter course has always been followed in the printing of the Greek New Testament and the Greek New Testament. So we take the manuscripts, all the manuscripts that we have, and that helps us, whether in different languages, in the Greek, in different languages, to, to make sure that we have what is accurate. This means that our modern text is an addition of the New Testament text restored through all the aids of textual criticism. What are some of the things that help us or aid us when it comes to ensuring that we have exactly what God wants us to have? Well, this is the idea of textual criticism and the authorities for restoring the text to make sure it's accurate in every way. Number one, as we've been talking about, are manuscripts. There are thousands of manuscripts. The first and primary source of, in, of information in restoring the text are manuscripts of the original language, which for the New Testament would be Greek manuscripts. So you want to go back to the original language. And you want to know what's said in those, uh, in those manuscripts. And we talked a little bit about that last week. The Sinaitic manuscript, the Alexandrian manuscript, and the Vaticanus manuscript. A second authority for uh, restoring the text and ensuring that what we have is trustworthy would be the different Bible versions. The Bible was translated by early Christians into many tongues. In addition to the Syriac the Latin and the Coptic, other versions like the Arminian, the Gothic, the Ethiopic, and the Georgian uh, translations or versions made their appearance in the early centuries of the Christian era. I love this idea of the Word of God spreading and being translated early for everyone to hear and to know God's Word. Surely these translations will furnish much helpful information. And they had to be made from some type of Greek text. And to find out what type of text each represents provides us with an independent line of witnesses. Another piece of authority to ensure that what we have is true outside of the manuscripts and the versions are the early Christian writers. Early Christian writers wrote extensively about their religion and quoted frequently from their sacred writings. We're talking about individuals who lived near the end of the first century and also in the second century and afterward. Volume after volume of these church fathers have been preserved. Listen to this. Many of which are literally filled with quotations of the New Testament. These early Christians possess copies of the Scriptures, which naturally are older than our manuscripts today because they were living at the end of the first century and early part of the second how their many quotations read certainly tell us much more concerning the ancient Bible of the primitive church. A professor by the name of Bruce Metzger has said and has written many books about how we got the Bible and the trustworthiness of the Bible. He has said this, that these early church writings are so extensive are these citations that if all other sources for our knowledge of the text of the New Testament were destroyed, they would be sufficient alone for the reconstruction 
are practically the entire New Testament. Think about that. The manuscripts, the versions, and also the writings of the church fathers. All of these are tools that we can use to undertake to restore the primitive text of the New Testament. And using these tools with discretion, it is possible to come so near the original autographs that we can all but grasp them in our hands. I think that is something worth all of us taking note of. And yet, there are individuals who will say, okay, I hear all of that, but what about all the errors that have been found in these manuscripts, right? What about all the errors? Let's talk about that. Number one, replace the word error with textual variance. All right, change the language, number one. Uh, Error often denotes something that is just totally off. It's more better to use the language textual variance as those who are involved with textual criticism use as well. Secondly, if someone were to say, well, there are 200,000 variants in the manuscripts that we have, and that number has been floated around before, how do we respond to so many variants or textual variants? Well, here's a good answer. This kind of large number is gained by counting all the variations in all the manuscripts. So, for example, if one slight variant were to occur in 4,000 different manuscripts, this would amount to, quote-unquote, 4,000 errors. But this is how one can arrive at a large number like 200,000. So there would be more variants because we have so many documents to compare one from another to ensure that what we have is indeed true. Most of these variants is... Oh, let me read this quote here because I think it's important as well. A person is either unlearned or of a skeptical mind who tries to take this large number of variations and use it in such a way as to undermine one's faith in the Word of God. I don't want anyone in the audience thinking today, well, I don't know if I can really trust the Word of God. No, this is all the more reason to trust the Word of God because we have so much evidence to make sure that what we have is indeed true. Now, many of these variations are simply spelling of a word or a name. So think about the man by the name of Apollos in Acts 18 and verse 24. Well, if his name is spelled differently in three different manuscripts, where there you go, there are some of the variations right there. Now, most of these are trivial variations in nature, and they have no consequence to the text as well. In all these cases, we have an abundance of information that enables us, even in trivial matters, to make a concrete decision as to the likely reading of the original text. And even if we did not have this information, as one person has stated, if we were left completely in the dark with reference to such things as spelling, word order, and other comparative minutiae, still we would not be in danger of losing the divine revelation. What's my point? Well, we have enough evidence to trust what we have to be the Word of God. Now, I often have to say this as well. There are some passages in your Bible And depending on what translation you have, you will sometimes have a passage that is bracketed and you will have something in the margin, an MSS. And sometimes it will say early manuscripts don't have this in the text. One example is Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 20. I'm reading from the New American translation and I have a bracket beginning in Mark chapter 16, verse number 9 to the end in verse number 20. And this is found in other places. If you study your Bible, if you go like to John chapter 7, verses 53 through John 8, verse 11, you'll see a bracket there. Depending on the translation, you'll see a bracket like in Acts chapter 8 and verse number 36 and 37 as well. So some have wondered, well, should Mark 16, verses 9 through 11, or 9 through 20, really be in the Word of God? Well, this could be a whole class on looking at the evidence. So you actually have evidence in both directions. You have evidence from early manuscripts and also later manuscripts of Mark 16, verses 9 through 20. So the evidence against it rests upon the Vatican and Sinaitic manuscripts from the 4th century, and they are often viewed as the very best manuscript, and as textual witnesses are acknowledged as being in a class by themselves. What the person there is saying that I'm quoting from is that you don't see verses 9 through 20 in two of those large early manuscripts. But the earliest known manuscript of the Old Syriac and the earliest known manuscript of the Latin Vulgate 
and a large number of Arminian manuscripts have it as well, or don't have it, and so forth. But in favor, there are other manuscripts like the Alexandrian, which is one of the earlier manuscripts as well, and the Ephraim, the Codex, uh, Beza, and other early unseals, which are those early manuscripts, as well as later manuscripts. So if I'm reading from Mark 16 in my margin, verse number 9, it says later manuscripts added. So sometimes people say, well, hold on a second here. Uh, How do I deal with this situation here? Let me read this. There's a statement from Arrhenius, an early Christian writer, which clearly shows the existence of Mark 16, verses 9-20, through in the second century, and who believed Mark was also its author. So there's evidence on both sides, and so what, what a Bible translation will do, it will just make you aware of this evidence. That's why they put it in a bracket, and that's why they have some details. But if you read through Mark 16, 9-20, and somebody says, well, I don't think it should be there, all right? If we take that out, we lose nothing from the Word of God. I'm not saying we take it out. I'm just saying if we take it out, we lose nothing from the Word of God. Look at verse 9. Now, after he had risen early on the first day of the week, but we have that evidence in other places. He first appeared to Mary Magdalene. We have that in other places, from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went and reported to those who had been with him while they were mourning and weeping. Read the other Gospels. We have that information. When they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, and they refused to believe it, after that he appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking along on their way to the country. Read the Gospel of Luke. We have that information. They went away and reported it to the others, but they did not believe them either. Afterward, he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at the table, and he reproached them for their unbelief and hardness of heart because they had not believed those who had seen him after he had risen. We have Matthew, Luke, and John that gives us these details as well, if we were to take this out of the text. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. That's Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. Somebody says, well, take that out. What does that mean about baptism? It means nothing. Read Romans chapter 6. Matthew chapter 28, Acts chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 3. If this is not supposed to be there, it changes nothing about the doctrine of the resurrection, about Jesus, about salvation, or baptism. In verses 17 through 20, read Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, who speaks about the miracles of the apostles. Here's my point. We have so many manuscripts when there are some variations that may be more serious than others, what the writers are doing or those who are making these translations, they put them in brackets so we can go back and look. But we can trust everything that's said in Mark 16, 9 through 20, whether we read it from Mark or whether we read it from another passage. Another reason to trust the Word of God. There is nothing to fear. What we have is true in every way. And the reason we can scrutinize these passages so much is because we have so much evidence to ensure that we get them right. So, can we trust the Bible? Yes. Listen to the words of Jesus. Can we trust the Bible? Yes. Consider the Dead Sea Scrolls. Can we trust the Bible? Yes. Historically accurate in every way, anytime something is found or identified connected to the Scriptures. Can we trust the Bible? Yes. Our translations go back to the original text that help us to see that we have what is true. Can we trust the New Testament writers as we wrap up? Yes, we can. Let me just give you some facts here, and if you want a copy of the outline, I'll send that out to you as well. Number one, the New Testament writers didn't make up the story of Jesus. People on YouTube and other books and sometimes will say things like this. They did not make up the story of Jesus. Rather, the story of Jesus was carefully recorded. Young people, you should memorize Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Especially if you're going into college, but even right now in middle school and high school, you need to memorize Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Because Luke was a historian, and Luke was a person who was with the Apostle Paul during his ministry. And Luke says, "...inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the Word." 
it seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus. He's writing to another Christian, so that you may know the exact truth about the things you've been taught. By the way, this teaches us something else. It teaches us that every Christian should be concerned about historical events, about history. That's what we have. We have the history and the story of Jesus. And we need to be concerned about these kinds of matter. The New Testament writers did not make up the story of Jesus. Rather, they carefully recorded the events concerning Jesus. They include numerous embarrassing details about themselves. Poor Matthew, who's trying to tell Jesus this will never happen. And Jesus says in Matthew 16, get behind me, Satan. Uh, If you're trying to make up a book and some writings and you have your Savior calling you Satan, that's not a good sign for you, or at least your heart at that moment. But they include all of these details. Why? Because they're only concerned about the truth and the facts. They include, maybe we should say, quote-unquote, embarrassing details about Jesus. Here's what I mean about that. Jesus, the one who's going to save the world from their sin, in John 6 and verse 66, many of His disciples stopped following Him. Well, if you're going to make up a story about a Savior to come and save the world, and most of His disciples stop following Him, that doesn't seem like a good direction to go. But they did that because they were only concerned about recording the truth. They carefully distinguished Jesus' words about, uh, with respect to their words and His words. Remember Acts chapter 20, Paul said, Jesus said to me, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Paul in 1 Corinthians 7 said, Not I, but the Lord has said this. They were careful in every way with His words. They included events about the resurrection they would not have invented. Like what? Well, like women being the first to the tomb. Like Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. Because during that time, their testimony would not really be held in high regard. So if you're going to make up a story, you're not going to include those kinds of details that people at that time would actually look down upon. Listen to this. They include at least 30 historically confirmed public figures in their writings. This is not fiction. Once upon a time in a land far, far, far away. This is not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the story of Jesus. And the story of Jesus is intertwined with history because He came in the flesh. They challenge their readers to check out verifiable facts, even about the miracles. What about 1 Corinthians 15? Paul says more than 500 of those who saw Jesus alive, they are still alive even today. You go talk to them if you don't believe me. He can make an argument like that because of all the people that were still alive during this time. And the New Testament writers challenge their readers to do that. And they describe miracles like other historical events. They're unembellished accounts, they're simple, and they're straight to the point because they actually happened. And they, like the apostles and other prophets, they abandoned their long-held sacred beliefs and practices and adopted new ones, and they did not deny their testimony under persecution or even at the threat of death. You see, the New Testament documents we have, you can examine them, you can check them, all written before the end of the first century. And even church, early church fathers, like Clement, Ignatius, and Polycarp, around 95 to 110 AD, they quoted passages out of 25 of the 27 New Testament books that we have right now. The New Testament documents, they were already being circulated at a very rapid pace. What's the point? The point is, the Bible, it is the Word of God. And it is trustworthy in every way. Do you believe that to be true? Consider this evidence. And as we wrap up, let me ask you a couple of questions. Number one, have you taken the time to investigate the Bible? Here's the thing. We don't have to be afraid to ask these kinds of questions or to preach these kinds of sermons, or when someone has some question about a particular text, okay, let's talk about it. It's good for us to investigate the Word of God. And we want our young people to have rock-solid faith so that their faith will not be shaken when in high school and college and just in life as a whole. 
or if they're on YouTube watching videos. Take the time to investigate the Bible and get the right resources. And finally, have you responded to the Bible? You can go through these historical lessons and history lessons, but you have to make a decision. We have to make a decision. You can love history, which is great, but are you going to respond to the historical evidence concerning Jesus with faith and obedience? You can study for 50 years. I don't know, maybe I should study a little bit more. Young man, young woman, you've got to make a choice. You've got to make a choice about whether or not you're going to believe the evidence of Jesus. Take the time to consider the evidence. But Thomas, when he put his hand in the side of Jesus, he said, my Lord and my God. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. The evidence is overwhelming. And yes, we have to walk by faith. We've never seen Jesus, never will until he returns. But there were Christians in 1 Peter chapter 1 in the first century who never saw Jesus. And yet they loved him. They believed in him. And they were born again as they obeyed the word of God. That is the kind of faith that you must have. And the free gift of salvation is available at this very moment. And what a pity it would be to have all this evidence and to die not saved. The Word of God. Jesus said, my words will never pass away. The free gift of salvation is available for you and for me to be in heaven one day with God. But mercy is on this side of life. And what a shame for those who will spend eternity in hell because they rejected all of this evidence of God's Word or at least they received all this evidence, but never made the decision to obey Jesus Christ. A sermon like this, yes, you can trust your Bible, but what are you going to do with your Bible? Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. You have to make a decision. And I hope and pray that your decision today is, I trust. I believe Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that He has risen from the dead. That the tomb of Jesus is empty. And that He's coming back one day with His angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know Him. Now is your time for mercy. Will you trust and obey? This song is for you. And we invite, this song, we invite you to come up front for the song of invitation. If you need to be saved, there's water behind us. You can be baptized because that's what Jesus said. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. If you do not believe in Me, you will not be where I am. That's what Jesus taught. And unless you repent, you will all likewise perish in your sin. That's what Jesus taught. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. That's what Peter taught. Will you trust and obey? Now is your time. Let's stand. Let's sing.